friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise and I glow in the dark. And so do you. A little while back I did a video featuring my adorable crested geckos and I mentioned that both of mine would be getting upgraded or refreshed enclosures. Well that's all done and today I will show you a couple of examples of some awesome bioactive enclosures for a crested gecko and hopefully give you a few ideas or inspiration for your own cresties. Let's go! If you haven't seen my video about crested geckos, you can check it out here, but high level, they are adorable little lizards from New Caledonia. They are primarily nocturnal and are very much arboreal in nature, using extremely grippy gravity-defying toes and a prehensile tail to climb and leap about forests and rocky crevices on their island home. So when setting up a home for crested geckos in our care, we need to take this into account. They need lots of vertical and horizontal surfaces to cling to and safe climbing enrichment, more on that in a bit, and little crevices to like wiggle into to hide during the day. They are quite jumpy and many like to forage on the floor at night so having some open areas up high to leap across and on the ground to walk about is also good. Okay so before I show you a couple of bioactive enclosures for my geckos complete with custom built backgrounds I want to show you that you can make an awesome enclosure that your crested gecko is going to love that is not bioactive. This is the enclosure that Zelda came with and it's perfect for a baby crested gecko. An adult or sub-adult will need something bigger, which is why Zelda is getting an upgrade. As you can see, this enclosure has lots of foliage and clutter and stuff like these plants and this viney stuff and the bridge. You can get all of this at any pet store, but if you want to save a few bucks, you can get similar stuff at like your local dollar store or even your craft store. There's a styrofoam back in here, which normally comes with exoterra enclosures, and it kind of just gives like this jungly forest vibe. It is also great because it helps make them feel a little bit more secure and safe. We have hides at different levels. Uh, there is a hide back there that's usually there, but it's not right now because we needed to see her. This cork thing, that, th like there's a bunch. And uh, this 3D printed one seems to be her favorite. She absolutely loves it. It's adorable. Not only are these great little secure hides, but they double as perches or climbing areas. The bottom is just paper towel, which may not look that great, especially since today would have been the day we changed it and we're not today because we're just moving her into a different enclosure. Anyways, it doesn't look the best, but it's a lot easier than replacing substrate and also makes it much easier to see your crestie's poops. Which one said aloud? does sound very weird. But when you have a new animal, especially a bebe, does bebe enjoy the theater? Their poop can be a great indicator of their health. So being able to see what's coming out can be very, very helpful. Another advantage of this setup is that it is super easy to take everything out and sterilize it. Not something that can be said about bioactive or naturalistic enclosures. This is an awesome home for a little crestie, and if you were to scale it up into a bigger enclosure, it would be perfect for an adult too. However, if you have been watching my channel, you probably know that I prefer to go with bioactive or naturalistic setups. So I have two enclosures built for my geckos, each with its own theme. I'll give you a quick rundown of how they were put together, and you let me know which one you like the best. Before I do, I need to give a big thanks to my patrons. All the supplies and materials I use to make these enclosures, I was able to buy thanks to the support from my patrons. You folks are directly responsible for the awesome new homes my geckos are getting, and I know that if they could talk or understand the concept of money or building things or of people they can't see, <laughs> they would be immensely appreciated of you too. Thank you so much. If you like my channel and the homes I build for my critters and would like to support and lend your help, please check out patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl. Thanks. Okay, let's start with Zelda's new home. For this, I'm using a hexagonal tank that used to be Nine Monkey's old home that's been in storage since she got her big home way back. Zelda is still growing, so this home will be suitable for at least a little while, and then she'll get another upgrade and end up in an enclosure like Night Monkey's, current one. For Zelda, I wanted to do like a ledgy, rocky background that could simulate the rocky areas of their homes in the wild. So I started with spray foam and built up some big chunky rocks and secured in a few branches to allow little cozy perches where she could just peek through and hang out, but have a solid wall behind her to help her still feel safe and less exposed. Crusties often like to cling upside down to vertical surfaces, and in captivity with a nutrient-dense diet, less stress, and less exercise, they tend to be a little bit more robust than their wild counterparts, 
and far more likely to keep their progressively heavier tails into adulthood. This can cause a condition called floppy tail syndrome, where the tail kind of goes limp and they can't stabilize it as well, and it kind of just flops over their back while they're resting upside down. It's mostly cosmetic and in and of itself, not a serious health concern, but it might be an indicator of other health issues and you'll still want to avoid it. Having an enclosure with enough height and climbing bits of different thicknesses is the best way to do that. This ensures that your gecko is getting enough exercise, moving around and using its tail to help stabilize and keeping it strong. And having some nice horizontal perches where they can occasionally rest without gravity strain on their tail is super helpful too we've got several options in this enclosure for that. Once the foam is cured, you can start sculpting it with a knife and just kind of cut it back. I should point out that in every one of these steps, there is something really important that you need to do in order for the project to come out okay. This was really, really important. Once you complete a step, you need to look at what you've done. Then you need to tell yourself that you've completely messed it up and even though like 80% of the work you just did on that step is going to be cut away or covered up in the next step, you need to convince yourself that you've ruined it. Then when you start the next step, you start to feel like a glimmer of hope and that, that it'll turn out okay and everything will be fine, but at the end of that step, you once again have ruined it. You must repeat this for each step and at the end of the project, it will, despite your best efforts, turn out just fine. And if it doesn't... See, in your world, you can create any illusion that you want. Any illusion. That's what's so great about this. Once the foam is carved, I use grout mix with some acrylic paint to build up my rocks out of the foam. You can use Pasteur of Paris or a dry lock or other similar stuff. I mixed up the paint to kind of match these uh, rocks that I got from a local landscaping company. I think they're really cool. So I think it worked out really well and I think it matches. Anyways, once it's dry, you do need to seal it. As with anything you put in your enclosure, you do need to make sure that it is fully cured before putting your animal in. Some of this stuff can be toxic or an irritant when not fully cured. Don't be impatient, just make sure you give everything the proper enough time to cure. After the sealant cured, I affixed some of those rocks I mentioned earlier, those ones, into the back and ledges. You can kind of see that back there. We'll have b-roll of this too and covered the non-rock areas with forest moss and some cocoa fiber i'm using an acrylic sealant on here to affix it all and you may feel the need to jump into the comments and tell me that i should only be using 100 percent silicone as that is the only safe thing to use just hold on i'll have a bit at the end explaining why that's not true the, the silicone part the silicone is safe part is true the notion that it's the only one not so much. We'll get to that later on. This part is easy, if a little messy. Just gloop your sealant on and around the area you want covered, toss some dirt onto it, and then smoosh it in a bit, and you're set. Once everything is dry, bang off the excess dirt, and then you can go back to any spots you may have missed or other decorations that you might want to add in, and you're ready for the next step, which is substrate. I've got a drainage layer under my soil and a cool little stumpy branch right there as like the sort of centerpiece. If you don't want to go venturing into the woods to find branches for your enclosures or pay insanely expensive amounts at pet stores and stuff, just wait until your neighborhood does a yard waste pickup week and then just go for a stroll. That's where I got this and a bunch of other branches in my enclosures and that's where they all came from. <laughs> Little tip, just wash them though because you know, dogs and puppers and squirrels too. Yeah, just wash them. Anyway, the stump has all sorts of climbing angles and spots for other branches to go at fun angles too. There's a nice ivy uh, down here that should grow up and kind of provide a bit more cover. Her feeding spot is actually on the door, which is not here right now, but it's about here. And I also affixed her 3D printed hide that she loves so much in here. I know it, it doesn't really match the aesthetic, but it's her favorite hide, so like, what are you gonna do? She has to have it in there. I think it turned out awesome. Let's see what Zelda thinks. All right, now that Zelda is all taken care of, let's move on to Night Monkey's home. Night Monkey has been living in this. 
it's cloaked, you can't see it. She has been in here for about a year and a half, but was temporarily evicted while it was rebuilt and refreshed. She wasn't too happy about that, but I think she'll forgive us with the end result. Can't take much credit for this, as aside from a little bit of assistance and some input, I had very little to do with this build. My dad tackled this project for me, and he was less than diligent with him filming his process, but a lot of the steps are pretty much the same, so no need to see every little detail again, eh? Let's take a look at how it all turned out and then I'll give you a rundown of what's what. Uh, we actually need to see this thing though, editing Annalise. Could you take care of this please? Oh, on it. There we go. Not bad. Lots of height, lots of vertical climbing with some horizontal bits there too. There are some fun bits of stuff here, but first I can't see a lot right now. So I hope I'm putting there's just a red fluff in there. Uh, that was a load-bearing red fluff. What did you just do? Oops. <laughs> yeah, all of this is painted in spray foam. I can't see. But good thing that there's B-roll. Anyways, there's tons of fun stuff in here, but first I'll run you through the process with what little build footage there actually is. So when I was planning my Lake Chapala Paludarium build, my dad had the idea of building trees that would hide the plumbing for the aquarium filter, which was a great idea and I'm super happy with how it turned out. These straight vertical trees made dad think of Endor from Return of the Jedi. To my younger viewers, Return of the Jedi was a Star Wars movie from the 80s before Star Wars was ruined, then redeemed, then kind of simultaneously ruined again, but also made awesomer. That's what I'm told. Anyway, he had this idea of building an ADAPT model and posing it in all broken down, sort of, in the water with a bunch of like ropey bridges crisscrossing and little huts for hides, the whole thing. My mom and I vetoed the idea because we are not enormous nerds and we continue with the very cool paludarium we have today. My cat's being weird. But the indoor idea stuck with dad, so that's what we did. Although, with only half of the space of the paludarium, he did have to scale way back. We've got a rocky ledge on one wall, made again with trimmed down foam, covered with grout for stony areas, cocoa fiber and forest moss, and some other decorative bits for the non-rock areas. The back is just a painting attached to the wall, and uh, having not touched a paintbrush since before I started my channel, I think he did a pretty good job. You can see little Star Wars stuff uh, that I'm told is a shield generator poking out from the trees and little space shippy guys zipping around. Pew pew. We've got nice tall trees throughout uh, this great big snake plant that was in her enclosure before and she loves to like hide in it. A new ivy that I hope will grow and kind of cover some of the trees and some Ewoky looking platforms and huts and a broken up rope bridge and a couple little guests and elsewhere too. Guests. I think it's a pretty cool looking little slice of Endor, don't you think? Let's see how Night Monkey enjoys it. So that's it for the builds. I did say earlier on that I would go over the whole you don't have to use silicone in your builds thing. If you are doing your own builds and want to hear about the other options that there are, that are just as safe and will probably save you some cash, stick around, there is some good information ahead. But if that doesn't interest you, that's okay. My feelings won't be hurt too bad. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like button, all that stuff, and remember to nurture all nature. For those sticking around, for the secret information, let's talk goop. Okay, the common knowledge in the hobby is that the only safe sealant to use in enclosure builds is aquarium grade silicone. And depending on who you ask, 100% type 1 silicone is now often cited as okay too. Both of these are fine, and when properly cured, are completely safe. But they are not the only safe options out there. This seems to be one of those examples of where just someone says something way back, I'm sure with complete sincerity, and maybe it was true at the time, and it kind of just got passed down as fact that gets repeated. The more it's repeated, the more true it becomes, you know, that sort of thing. So now you have possibly misguided but well-meaning keyboard warriors calling people animal abusers for using something other than what they heard was the only safe thing to use. So let's clear up some misconceptions. 
Let's start with aquarium grade silicone. The difference between aquarium grade silicone and other silicone is many additional dollars. And that aquarium grade has more adhesive properties and is more flexible and resistant to cracking. It's really meant to be gluing and sealing the walls of aquariums together. So unless you are replacing a cracked panel on your vivarium or affixing really heavy rocks or wood to walls, you probably don't need aquarium grade silicone. Moving on to type one and type two 100% silicone. Type one is usually considered the safe one, but in reality, both are perfectly safe if used properly. If used properly. One more time. If used properly. The main difference for our purposes between the two is what is used as a curing agent. Type one uses an acid curing agent, specifically acetic acid. That's why it smells like vinegar when it cures. Type two uses a basic curing agent. Oh, basic here refers to the pH level over seven, not basic as in, guess what, Michael, ya basic. Anyways, the basic agent in type two is most commonly ammonia, which is why type two smells like cat pee as it cures. Mmm, cat pee. Type 1 silicone is significantly cheaper, however it takes longer for it to be ready to use for normal household applications like painting or being waterproof. But the curing agent dissipates or off-gasses completely faster than type 2, meaning you can move animals in sooner. I always give it at least a week uh, just to be on the safe side, even longer if I can't put it outside to air out. Type 2 silicone is ready to use much faster, but takes longer for all of the, the curing agents to off-gas. The agent is also more of an irritant than type 1. It's supposed to be more flexible and stick to a broader range of surfaces too, so depending on what you're using it for, it might be the better choice. But given the cost, the faster off-gassing, and lower irritation, silicone 1 is probably the better choice for most of the time. But in terms of safety, as long as you let both completely cure, I'll say that again, completely cure, they're both equally safe to use. But in my opinion, there's an even better option than silicone for most builds. I've used silicone in a ton of my builds because it works great and I too believed it was the only safe one. But for most of the builds now, I use this stuff. It's DAP Dynaflex 230, it's an acrylic sealant. It comes in different colors, just like silicone, but it's thinner, spreads more easily, and stays wetter longer, so you have more time to work with it. But it cures fully overall in a comparable time to type one silicone, and the fumes aren't as potent either. Oh, and did I mention, it is way cheaper. <laughs> Before the pandemic, I was paying $8 a tube for silicone. Then it went up to nine, then 12. It's $15 now, but this stuff, costs seven dollars that is a constant two for one sale and i mean who doesn't like a two for one sale the other thing i like is that this dries with a sort of matte finish silicone is very glossy and if you don't fully cover it up or something kind of peeks through you see the shiny silicone underneath and it looks less than natural the matte finish of the acrylic looks so much better if any peeks through, you miss any spots. Now, I do find that it is more squishy once it does set and doesn't quite hold heavy stuff as well as silicone, but overall, I much prefer this to silicone in most applications. This is perfectly safe to use, again, once fully cured. In fact, Reptile Basics and some other PVC enclosure manufacturers recommend this stuff specifically to seal their enclosures instead of silicone because it doesn't often bond well to PVC, this stuff does. Now, I'm not saying that you should use this stuff only and you shouldn't use silicone. If you feel more comfortable with the tried and true type one silicone, keep using it. I just wanted to share that there are a few other options out there that I have been using for some time now and that have also been perfectly safe and been super reliable. And of course, do your own research on the specifics of your animals that you're keeping for this stuff. Don't just believe some kid on the internet and call it a day. I think that should go without saying, but mm, you know. One last thing on the topic of anti-mildew properties. Mill decides, it is so funny to see that word spelt out. Sorry, just had to. Mildew sides or other chemicals that kill mold and mildew can be very toxic to reptiles and amphibians in particular. There is a difference between anti-mildew and mildew resistant. Anti-mildew means that there are ingredients in there specifically to kill or prevent mildew and that could be harmful to your pet. 
don't use it. Mildew resistant labels usually, not always, but usually means that just by the nature of the compound, mildew doesn't grow well on it. Nothing's added specifically to fight the mildew, it's just what it is. It's like slapping a fire resistant sticker on a bottle of water. It's not inaccurate, but you didn't need to do anything special to make it true, and the water bottle without that sticker isn't any less fire resistant, you know? You can find material data sheets for all these sealants online. Take a look at that and see what's in there. You may need to Google some of these ingredients and what they do, but it's not too hard to verify whether or not there's an actual mildicide in the sealant. So that's it for today. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please hit that like button and consider subscribing. Let me know which build or enclosure you liked more and uh, whether or not my dad did a good job on his Endor themed enclosure, this one right here. What about you? Do you like building themed tomes for your reptiles? I'd love to hear all of that in the comments below and how you set up your reptiles enclosures. Thanks to all of you for watching, commenting, all the great stuff. And until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. I hit the thing. Bye. For man you have for man you, um. Anyways, the back is just a painting. Guests, be a guest. <clears throat>